Shkadi and Villa on Garmehe, Slaunch, Agus Kurm Hope Strelig, and Dara Shem, and I call on Deputy Brendan Howland uh, to move the second reading motion. I move that it will be read the second time now. Uh, that's agreed. agreed. That's agreed. Uh, you're going to speak to us now about the bill, Deputy Howland. In, in moving the second reading of the Health and Social Care Professionals Amendment Bill 2016, um, about 10 years ago, a small organisation uh, came into existence called Choice Ireland. It was founded after a public meeting on the Eighth Amendment of the Constitution, uh, which was organised by Labour Youth. During their period of activity, I've no doubt that that organisation helped move the conversation in Ireland uh, considerably in uh, a detailed and reflective consideration on the Eighth Amendment. One of the actions that the group undertook was to highlight the extent to which rogue agency, agencies were lying to women in crisis pregnancy agencies. I know one of the women involved in that group very well. Sinead Hearn is in fact the chairperson of Labour Women nowadays. She was one of a small number of women who went undercover to determine the true extent of what was going on in those so-called rogue agencies. When speaking on this issue recently, Sinead noted her shock to discover that these same agencies were still operating a decade later. Somehow, we all collectively looked the other way for the last number of years. And I took the brave work of two journalists, Ellen Coyne and Catherine Sands of the Times to refocus us to the lies, the deceit, and in sometimes uh, the, the grotesque mistruths being told to women in crisis pregnancy situations. But it's not enough for us to express our horror or outrage and then for the issue to disappear once more. To do so would leave these agencies operating for another decade abusing countless women when they are in most need of care and support and above all the truth. It is no longer tenable to stand over a situation where dietitians and opticians must be regulated before they can offer any service to the general public. But those counselling women in very vulnerable situations when they're very vulnerable themselves, face no requirement to register or be regulated at all. It's not good enough for us to stand over the situation <clears throat> where women are being lied to in what sometimes amounts to a grotesque fashion at a time of this vulnerability. Women in crisis pregnancy situations are being told that abortion increases a woman's risk of breast cancer, or that women who have had abortions will later abuse or neglect any children they might have. These are lies told to scare, to humiliate, to denigrate women. And most of all, to prevent them from having access to the impartial information that they're entitled to before they make choices for themselves. We're a long past time for an honest conversation about gender equality in Ireland. We continue to hear a litany of statistics about the enduring problem of domestic violence in this country. We heard again this morning about the persistence of the gender pay gap, which amounts in the analysis done to 20% between men and women. Too many women remain in low paid, insecure work. Too few women are breaking through the glass ceiling of senior roles in public and private sectors. And of course, access to affordable childcare in Ireland for every family still looks like a distant dream. We have, thankfully, Count Corla, more women in this house than ever before. Waking the feminists are doing exceptional work to improve the position of women in theatre in Ireland. There are other efforts to increase the number of women on state boards, in academia, in science careers and elsewhere. 
But we've still a long way to travel on the road to true equality. And we need to have a broader discussion on these matters. The discussion is happening outside this chamber. It's time, too, we started a frank discussion here. Today, of course, we're dealing with one way in which we permit the mistreatment of women in Ireland. Rectifying this problem won't solve all the other issues that I've mentioned, but even the elimination of this one injustice will represent a step towards equality. And every step on that journey matters. For all the reasons I have outlined, I believe that new legislation is needed to regulate this area. We in the Labour Party have chosen the Health and Social Care Professionals Act as the vehicle for the proposed reform, the vehicle we think is best suited to deal with um, eliminating rogue counselling agencies uh, from the spectrum. That particular act applies to the newer health and social care professions outside the traditional core sectors of medicine and nursing. The act establishes registration boards for those designated professions. It protects the use of the titles of those professions. And it provides for the resolution of complaints relating to fitness to practice. Now, I know that there are many there, are, there may be some uh, who, for practical difficulties, that this act might find might be difficult to apply to some uh, crisis pregnancy counsellors. And I have discussed my proposal several times with the Minister for Health, Simon Harris, here present, and with his officials. And I thank him uh, for the frank and forthright way in which he has approached dealing with this uh, difficult and sensitive issue. I acknowledge and appreciate that the Minister is anxious to cooperate on this bill and to co accommodate what he recognises as much needed reform in this area and that he has instructed his department and his department officials accordingly. As I understand it, the problem from an administrative perspective is this. The Health and Social Care profession Professionals Act applies automatically to certain professions that are directly named in the legislation itself. These include, for example, uh, chiropodists, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, and psychologists. These professions already have what we might call the infrastructure of a recognized and regulated profession. They are a defined scope of practice, a representative professional body, defined routes of entry, and recognised qualifications. The Act then goes on to enable the Minister by regulation to designate additional health and social care professions. He does so by reference to the stipulated factors. In other words, the Minister assesses whether the profession has in place the infrastructure to enable it to be regulated. Normally speaking, the path towards recognition and designation may take months, if not years, involving consultation, assessment, and the satisfying of preconditions and so on. I propose in my bill to fast-track this process for those involved in pregnancy counselling. I'm proposing to amend the Act itself so as to include these professionals in the category of those directly designated in the Act itself. I do so unashamedly and for the reason that is in fact spelled out in the, the Act itself, in section 4A3 of the 2005 Act. In deciding whether it is appropriate and in the public interest that a particular health or social care profession should be designated, we as legislators insisted in that section that the regard must be had to, and I quote, the degree of risk to the health, safety or welfare of the public from incompetent, unethical or impaired practice of the profession." Close quotes. That is the factor I want to home in on, and it's the reason that I'm proposing the amendment I do. I believe that giving incompetent, unethical and impaired advice or counselling to vulnerable women with crisis pregnancies represents an unacceptable risk to their health, 
their safety and their welfare. In these circumstances, I don't believe we have the time for a more leisurely route. I believe immediate action is warranted. As I say, I know that the Minister and his officials share these concerns and they've signalled that they're anxious to work cooperatively to secure um, a workable way forward. A department consul consultation process is already underway in respect of counselling generally, but crisis pregnancy counselling has not as yet been specified as a separate social care profession. I recognise that there are practical hurdles, but if we do nothing and simply await developments that I don't believe we will see in any acceptable uh, framework of time, the necessary criterion being satisfied by the profession itself. We won't see agreement on a defined scope of practice, we won't see a representative professional body, and we won't see agreement on recognised qualifications. It may be, when we've had the opportunity to consider this further in committee, that we will find a solution that combines aspects of this body of legislation with another act that I had some involvement with when I was Minister for Health some years ago. And that is the Regulation of Information Services Outside the State for the Termination of Pregnancies Act of 1995. That act arose from the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. The amend that amendment enshrines in, in, in the Constitution, uh, under Article 43.3, that it cannot be used to limit the freedom to receive or impart information about services available in another state subject to such conditions as may be laid down by law. The 1995 Act lays the, down those specific conditions. It seeks to reflect an appropriate balance between the constitutional rights and freedoms bearing on the question of abortion information. The Supreme Court had decided on a number of cases that the dissemination of information on abortion, such as the name, address and telephone number of a foreign abortion service and the method of communication with it, was in fact unconstitutional. But the European Court of Human Rights had held that these Supreme Court injunctions were in fact in breach of Article 10 of the European Convention relating to freedom of expression and the right to receive and impart information. The legislation was passed to give effect to the 14th Amendment. It sought to clarify the legal entitlements and obligations of persons and agencies who give abortion information and to ensure that any doctor or advice agency that provides abortion information to pregnant women does so only in the context of full counselling on all the available options without any advocacy or promotion of abortion. From discussing the matter with the Minister's officials, I understand that he and they emphasise Section 5 of that Act. That section applies to anybody who engage, engages in the activity of giving information, advice or counselling to indiv individual members of the public in relation to pregnancy. The section says that where such a person is requested by a pregnant woman to give information, advice or counselling in relation to her particular circumstances, it is not lawful for the person to give what is called act information to the woman unless that information, counselling and advice is truthful and objective. The Department of Health's view is that a rogue counselling agency may well be in breach of that statutory requirement. In other words, it may be found that the information it provides, if it isn't fair and accurate, is, under, in legal terms, not truthful or objective. I have no problem with that as far as it goes. But it is important to bear in mind that the scope of the 1995 Act is confined to a particular type of information, what is called Act Information. And this is information which is likely to be required for women in availing themselves of pregnancy termination services. In other words, um, in other words, act information um, being uh, information that uh, helps somebody have a, an, an abortion. So back to the subject matter of the original Supreme Court uh, injunctions it would mean providing the name, address and telephone number of a foreign abortion service and so on. Thus, 
As the then Minister for Health, Michael Noonan, pointed out in the second stage of that bill when it was going through this House, that Act does not apply to more general information, such as information about the nature of abortion. So if a rogue agency uh, which sought to restrict access to information provided information to women that is objectively untruthful, it could, I believe, still give uh, inaccurate information and not be subject uh, to, to that legislation. So we believe that uh, it is important, uh, Kian Korla, and I'm conscious that my time has expired, that we will have a, a workable solution uh, to outlawing this practice of giving uh, totally inaccurate, uh, misleading and damaging information uh, to women at a time of crisis. Uh, we believe that the legislation we have proposed is the, the, the best and quickest method to do that. Uh, I welcome the support for the principle of the, uh, of the legislation from the Minister and I look forward to working with him uh, to find a mechanism that will bring uh, a form of legislation onto the statute books at an early point that will achieve those objectives.